Coming up on Market to Market. The Agriculture Department reduces its previous estimate on U.S. corn production. And the rhetoric gets heated as candidates debate everything from trade policy to a lack of progress on the next farm bill. Those stories and market analysis with Mark Gold, next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by DuPont Pioneer, working with growers to match the right product to the right acre. Science with service, delivering success. This is the Friday, October 12th edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. The impact of higher gasoline prices was evident at the wholesale level last month. According to the Labor Department, wholesale prices rose 1.1% in September. The inflation was noted in the wake of a 1.7% gain in, the, in August, reflecting the largest single-month increase in more than three years. In both months, wholesale prices were driven higher by gasoline, which rose nearly 10% in September. Core prices, which exclude the volatile food and energy sectors, were unchanged last month, reflecting their best showing in nearly a year. Separately, the government reported America's cavernous trade deficit widened to a three-month high in August as slowing demand for U.S. autos and farm goods pushed exports to their lowest level in six months. A wider trade deficit, of course, is not a welcome development for the economy. And with the clock ticking down to Election Day, the rhetoric heated up this week as candidates debated everything from tax policy to a lack of progress on the next farm bill. Why they is arriving. he wrong about that? He is wrong about that. There, you, can, that? you can cut tax rates by 20 percent and still preserve these important preferences for middle class taxpayers. Not mathematically it, possible. It, it is mathematically possible. It's been done before. It's precisely what we're proposing. <laughs> it has never been done before. It's been done a couple of times, actually. It has never Jack been Jack Kennedy done lowered tax rates, increased growth. Ronald oh, Reagan. Oh, now you're Jack Kennedy. Over the past few years, U.S. agriculture has been a bright spot in dismal economic times. But that doesn't mean the farm sector is above the fray of campaign rhetoric. This week, agriculture stepped into the spotlight of several farm state debates. In Montana, incumbent Senator John Tester and Representative Denny Rayburg fought to differentiate themselves on the Farm Bill. It's a bill that makes sense. It goes over to the House, the Congressman gives it lip service, it doesn't go any further. Let me tell you, I would still be in session. I would still be in session, would not be on vacation with the Senate until we got that Farm Bill passed if I was in the same boat. Does anybody in the room believe that I don't want to see a Farm Bill? I'm fighting for the Farm Bill. I do not agree with my own leadership. I'm doing everything I possibly can to try and bring that bill out of committee and onto the House floor. Tester and Rayburg also sparred over trade. Rayburg accused Tester of voting against agreements that would help Montana's wheat producers by exporting agricultural goods overseas to places like Colombia and South Korea. I'm not opposed to trade at all. I think that it's, it's important that we do have trade, but it can't be at our producers' expense. And I felt those trade agreements were skewed, and that's why I opposed them. You know what's interesting about that with Colombia and Panama and South Korea, which I voted for? Since that time, we've increased our agricultural exports from Montana to those countries by 200 percent. I see a more positive future. The Nebraska Senate race features candidates who both acknowledged agriculture's role. 33 percent of the labor force in the Cornhusker state is directly dependent on agriculture. Agriculture is important to this state. But what's important is that we always work together as a state. There's urban interest, there's rural interest, and they all coincide. That's how we grow our economy. In fact, we've weathered this economy fairly well here in the state of Nebraska because the ag economy has been strong. Former Senator Bob Kerry aired frustration over the issue's absence from the national campaign. I'm actually quite appalled that neither Governor Romney or President, President uh, Obama is talking about agriculture in this campaign. It's an enormously important part. It's the foundation of the U.S. economy. And ethanol, I fought for ethanol since I was governor. It's been a great success. It's lowered the price of fuel. It's improved the quality of our economy. It's created tens of thousands of jobs. This isn't a failure. This isn't a threat to our, to, to our economy. The interests of agriculture and the interests of the United States of America are completely in a line. It's, there's no need to choose. And in Iowa's 3rd Congressional District, two incumbents, thrown together after redistricting, sparred over the lack of a new farm bill. 
We ought to be back to working on it. It's a failure of leadership not to bring it to the floor. It passed the Senate last June, bipartisan out of committee, bipartisan from the Senate, came over the House, passed the bill out. There it sets, and uh, leadership has not uh, brought it to the floor. And I think it come to the floor, probably some amendments, go to conference and get that done. But you cannot go out and plan next year's operation without knowing what the farm bill is. You have to have that information. Uh, out of about $800 billion of spending, there was about a $16 billion reduction. Now, some people think that's too much. That's only, uh, what, 2%. The food stamps uh, with the stimulus bill, the eligibility was dramatically increased. The, the, uh, benefit was increased about 20 percent. Now, the people were hurting, obviously, but I think it's time to look at it to make sure that the, uh, the there is not you know, waste, fraud, and abuse. A senior U.S. trade official predicted this week that U.S. farm exports will fall by as much as $2 billion this year because of the drought. America's chief agricultural negotiator, Izzy Siddiqui, said tight supplies of grains are driving up the cost of feed, which in turn is inflating beef and poultry prices. The Agriculture Department also is calling for a decline in U.S. farm exports this year. And in its latest supply and demand estimates, this week USDA reduced previous estimates on U.S. corn production. While the September report found fewer bushels of corn in farm country, more bushels of wheat and soybeans were expected by the end of harvest. But the bigger story can be found deeper in the numbers. USDA officials cut their U.S. corn production estimate by 21 million bushels to 10.7 billion bushels. If realized, that would be the eighth largest harvest on record. The national average yield was cut to 122 bushels per acre, but the report indicated farmers planted an additional 500,000 acres. The U.S. stocks-to-use ratio in September continued its razor-thin trend, falling to an even skinnier 5.6 percent, a full percentage point lower than last month. While the ratio is tight, it remains above the 5 percent seen in 1996. Government analysts also reduced projected corn exports by 100 million bushels based on slow sales and strong competition from Brazil. Globally, corn carryout shrank more than 6.5 million metric tons, putting the global stocks-to-use ratio at 13.7 percent, its lowest level in nearly 15 years. Early season cash and futures prices, as well as premiums for forward contracting, helped squeeze the season average price by 10 cents to between 7.10 and 8.50 per bushel. Planted acres for soybeans were projected to increase by 9 percent, while average yields are projected to rise 7 percent to 37.8 bushels per acre. If realized, U.S. soybean production will hit 2.86 billion bushels, 6% lower than last year, and 15% lower than the record year of 2010. Official domestic soybean ending stocks figures were increased by 13%, putting the stocks to use ratio at 4.5%. That's slightly tighter than last month, but it's the thinnest margin since 2003. U.S. exports were projected to rise by nearly 20 percent to 1.3 billion bushels due to increased supply and lower prices. The global soybean stocks to use ratio is projected at nearly 21 percent. While deemed adequate by some private firms, ever increasing Chinese demand is predicted to leave little room for weather shortfalls in the years ahead. The official average soybean price range is estimated at $14.25 to $16.25 per bushel, narrowing the guess by $0.75 cents on both ends of the scale. U.S. wheat production estimates were 1 million bushels higher at 2.3 billion bushels. However, lower domestic wheat ending stocks and increased feeding dropped the stocks to use ratio by two percentage points from last month to 26.3 percent, its lowest in five years. The projected average price is $7.65 to $8.55 per bushel, reducing both ends of the range by 15 cents. Notions of increased production accompanied by tighter supplies pushed grain markets higher. Despite a seemingly bearish report on soybeans and wheat, prices rallied. And tighter corn supplies put the bears in hibernation on LaSalle Street, where December corn moved nearly limit up on the news Thursday. Next. The Market to Market Report. 
Thursday's post report rally proved to be short lived as the coarse grains gave Mac most of their gains on Friday. For the week, December wheat traded fractionally lower, while the nearby corn contract moved three cents higher. Soybeans also headed south this week as the November contract settled with a weekly loss of 29 cents, while nearby meal prices declined by $6 per ton. In the softs, cotton also traded lower as the December contract lost 13 cents. In the dairy market, November Class 3 milk futures gained 9 cents, while the deferred contract moved 44 cents higher. Over in livestock, December cattle lost 70 cents, nearby feeders were off nearly $2, and the December lean hog contract gained $1.82. In the financials, the euro lost 63 basis points against the dollar, crude oil gained $1.98 per barrel, COMEX gold declined by $21 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs commodity index gained nearly 10 points to settle at 665.75. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Mark Gold. Mark, welcome back. Nice to be back, Mike. It's good to have you here. It's been a a busy couple of weeks in the broader markets, especially as we look at at, uh, geopolitical events, especially in the Middle East. What do you see the events in Iran having what kind of an effect on our oil prices? Well, certainly what's happening in Iran, we've got a lot of protests there. We have the people losing a lot of the value of their own currency. It's gone down by about 50%. The economic sanctions are certainly having a real impact on Iran. The protesters are in the streets. Is it enough to overthrow the regime? Probably not. They've got a pretty good control on things. I don't really see that happening anytime soon. But certainly, all of the the turmoil in the Middle East has helped driven up the uh, oil prices. Every time there's a problem between Syria in Iraq, or Iran rather, we have problems there. So if we can get the crude oil higher, it's certainly gonna help the ethanol market, which has been really a drag uh, with, the, with the crude oil back down around $90 a barrel. But the fact of the matter is if things heat up in the Middle East, crude's gonna go higher, that's gonna help the ethanol market. If, things, if the regime does change there, then you can look for sharply crude, lower crude oil prices in my opinion. Now how, how far in advance, I mean, how much are we going to be seeing these prices change going forward? Is it just headline driven? We're just going to have to keep an eye on the news? You know, one day these grain markets hit the skids. The next day they come back. They're back down again. Uh, a lot of the traditional technical factors haven't done anything in these markets. So you've got to be very cautious about you know what you're listening to and how to trade these markets and to get maximum uh, protection and because the volatility is so extreme out there. All right. Another issue I'd like to talk to you about a little bit, uh, the Federal Reserve is continuing uh, QE3 or QE infinity. What effect is that having on the dollar as we go forward? Well, the dollar is going to be a component certainly of QE3. It's going to be a proponent of what happens in the election. Uh, Certainly if uh, Romney gets elected, I think that's going to be a pro-business, stronger dollar type move. Uh, That certainly won't help our export market. If you look at the corn exports, we're down to nothing as it is. But the fact of the matter is the dollar is going to have a key impact on corn, on wheat, and to some extent the bean market. The Chinese seem to have an appetite for our beans regardless of what the price is. Every time we have a good break in the soybean market, they step in and buy some. But the fact of the matter is the dollar will play an important part in long-term uh, prices. All right. Let's talk wheat a little bit. You mentioned it there just briefly. Where, where do you see mar- wheat headed in the weeks coming? Well, the wheat's got a couple of issues. First of all, we've got the continued dryness in the United States, particularly in the southern, southwestern plains. We've got the dryness in western Australia. The report on Thursday said that Australia's crop is down about 3 million metric tons from previous estimates. That was part of what brought the world wheat carryouts down by about 4 or 5 million uh, tons. Now, we harvest wheat somewhere in the world every month. And the markets haven't responded well to some of the lower production estimates either from Australia or from the U.S. You know, you and I have been around this country a long time, and we know the plant in the dust, the beans will, the bins will bust. And we're certainly planting a lot of this wheat in the dust, but hopefully we'll get the rains, we'll have the crops. I personally think that the wheat market can be a little soft in here. I don't see any other real problems around the world. They only lowered the Russian estimate by a million metric tons. It could have been a lot worse. Russia still may be a player in this export market. Everybody's expecting them to run run out of exportable supplies and turn to the U.S. That hasn't happened so far. So I'm a little bit bearish on this wheat market for the time being. All right. So uh, 
So for folks with, with wheat stored out there, hold it. Well, uh, if, if you're going to hold it, I would certainly consider putting a put option underneath to protect the downside. I think you've got to look in your own local in your own local market, see what the basis levels are. If you've got strong basis, there's no real incentive to carry the wheat in that area, then go ahead and sell the wheat. You can always buy back a call option to replace that wheat if you still believe there's upside potential in the market. But certainly, not only for the crop they've got in the bin, but you've got to be looking at these new crop prices as well. We've got seven and seven and a half dollar new crop prices out there, even higher for Minneapolis and Kansas City. You've got to look at protecting these prices because certainly this wheat market can turn around and be five dollar wheat in a heartbeat, and you don't want to leave these kind of great prices on the table. All right, so be aware, keep keep uh, track of your surroundings, and you know manage this smart. risk and and. Don't forget, even though we've been tight in all grains and in the soybeans over the last really 18 months because of the weather, things can change in a hurry. The world will ramp up production, and lower prices can certainly be out there. All right. Let's talk corn a little bit. Corn had a big move this week. Uh, yesterday, we saw nearly limit up day for corn, and today? Uh, back down another 25, three, 25 cents. Uh, that, what's the market thinking? I believe every time we've had one of these spikes in the markets, whether it was the stocks report on the 30th, whether it was this production report, we get these spikes up in the market. After the first one in September, we just kind of hung around there for about four or five days, couldn't move higher, and then broke. We were back, before the report on Thursday, we were back down to near the lows of this leg of the move. We had the bullish report on Thursday, couldn't get limit up. I've always said as a trader, a lot of times it's what a market can't do that's as indicative of what it can do. And we couldn't go limit up on Thursday, which told me that there was some fundamental, if this was another game-changing report, why didn't we go limit up? We've had two of these game-changing reports now, yet the corn market hasn't acted very well in the subsequent days. Uh, so again, every time, the reason I believe that's happening is every time we get to seven and a half, 760, 770 corn, we keep just destroying this demand base. Look at the exports, you know, virtually zero on corn exports. We know we're hurting the ethanol demand out there dramatically. The one question mark is, when will we cut back on domestic feed usage? It didn't show up in the September quarterly report. It may show up in the end of the year quarterly report. But certainly we're going to see liquidation. If you look around, you see dairy producers hurting and going out of business, poultry producers going out of business because of the high feed costs. This is eventually going to cause some liquidation, some backing off of demand. And, you know, there's more talk about importing corn from Brazil. There was another rumor this week about another 500,000 metric tons coming into the U.S. So one of the problems with this high prices is farmers and other end users have figured out that there are other ways to feed animals. And that can be a little bit of a permanent destruction on the demand base here as they've found other alternatives besides corn to feed. So again, when a market can't react positively to two, the, you know, when they came out, they were considered two game-changing reports. And what's happened? We've fallen back both times. Again, I think that's indicative of a market that may have a problem. All right. So with that in mind, for folks out there, maybe their yields are coming in better than expected, they've got extra corn, what should they be doing? What do you think is the word for the producers out there? Well, the, world for the, the word for the producers is there's no real carry in this market, no real incentive to hold this grain. I'd be selling it, looking for other opportunities. If you still believe that, as some of the bulls believe that we're, we're gonna run out of corn February, March in that time frame, then go ahead and buy yourself a March or a May call and try to stay in the game. Spend 20 or 25 cents on a call option to see if it's there. Cheaper than storing that grain for the next six months. So I would certainly be looking at some opportunities here. We had the nice rally. We're still well over $7 in, in 2012 corn. These aren't prices to turn your nose up at and <laughs> something I would certainly take a look at. And new crop as well. You've got new crop prices sitting out here around six and a half dollars a bushel. Again, just four months ago on, on May 1st and June 1st, we were looking at five dollar corn. Now we've got new crop corn at 650. Nobody wants to protect that because the old crop went to 850. In the 40 years, almost 40 years I've been around this business, every time an old crop gets to an extreme high and drags that new crop up, it's always been a phenomenal marketing opportunity. The only reason new crop 2013 corn has gone to 650 is because of what the old crop did. Take advantage of it, 
buy some puts, protect that downside. All right, plan for next year. Absolutely. All right, well, let's talk soybeans a little bit. Okay. Now, soybeans, we've been bearish a couple weeks now on beans. Yes. Again yesterday, and again today, I should say. Yeah. What, where do you see beans headed? Well, I'll tell you, if they hadn't added the exports, they raised the exports 210 million bushels. If they just would have raised it half of that, we'd be looking at 250 carryouts on this bean market, and beans would be a $12 item today. Uh, we found this bigger production. I believe it's getting even bigger. And again, here's a market that frankly couldn't act worse. We closed on Friday night at the lowest level since I think July 6th in this market. Tells me we've got a problem out there. Uh, we're under some of the key moving averages. Funds are long. Yesterday, the funds bought 50,000, or the open interest went up 50,000 contracts in corn. There's a lot of new longs in this market. They're looking at some pretty good losses here today. So, you know, beans and corn, we've got the funds long. They should be short, in my opinion, certainly on the beans, and they're not. We've gotten two solid sell signals where the funds should be short. They're still long. That tells me that there's still more downside potential in these markets. There is a gap in the beans at 478. I believe they're going to try to fill that maybe next week. Then we'll see if we can hold that. Everybody's trying to look for this seasonal low to try to buy something in here. All I see is bigger and bigger production and Brazil if they just have normal weather, forget about 80 million metric tons, they're going to be a lot closer to the high end at 83 million metric tons. World soybean stocks are going up. Frankly, I don't have a clue what beans are doing here at 15 and a half and $16. I believe that there's tremendous risk out there yet in the bean market. All right, so guys harvesting right now look to sell. I would be selling them. All right. You know, again, if you think there's higher prices out there, if you believe the bull argument that we're going to run out of beans, and let's face it, the carryout's tight at 130. If you believe that we're going to run out of beans until the Brazilians can get here, then go buy yourself some March or May calls and stay in this game. But the fact of the matter is, I believe we're still at least a bushel or two light on the, what the yield's going to ultimately be. Tack on another 75 or 150 million onto this carryout now that we've added the exports back in. And I think you've got a problem out there. All right. Now let's talk livestock a little bit. You mentioned some demand destruction going on on the corn side as, as folks look to liquidate. We're not seeing much in the cattle market. Is that your impression? Not, not, not only not in the cattle, but we didn't see it on the, quarter, the, uh, the hog numbers that were released on the quarter. Uh, haven't seen the big liquidation that we have thought we've seen, which kind of justifies that those feed figures haven't really come down. I think that's got to change. You know, we saw when the corn was up, limit up on or near limit up on Thursday. Feeder kettle took a big hit. I think the Jans were limit down. Uh, that's going to continue. And the, if corn prices stay up at these levels, we are going to see liquidation in cattle and in, in hogs. We've already seen it in dairy and poultry. Now the question, I think the big question is probably the hogs. That's going to be, in my opinion, probably the easiest to liquidate. And if we have that demand destruction, that's going to hurt the corn prices as well. All right. And I think the liquidation is, is starting to come in because we see these high prices on those mid-months starting in, you know, uh, uh, Feb and April hogs. We see some pretty big premiums in there, which the market believes is a result of this liquidation. All right. And let's come back to, to feeders a little bit. You mentioned limit down uh, or nearly limit down on Thursday. What, what do you see in the near term for feeders? I believe the feeder cattle and the fat cattle market are tied to two things. Obviously, the price of grain, and the second thing is the stock market and the economy. The stock market's been able to hang around this 13,500 mark. Housing's a little bit better. Things are picking up a little bit. Unemployment apparently is down a little bit. Um, that tells me that we've still got a pretty good demand. The box beef trade's been pretty strong. It backed off a little bit Thursday, Friday, but we've had some pretty good prices there. Cash cattle prices, 124, 125, and that range still strong. The charts are kind of in a no man's land here. They don't really want to seem to try to go for some new highs. They don't want us to try to seem to make new lows. So a little bit of a quandary from a technical standpoint. But fundamentally, I think as long as the economy stays strong and we can work the grain prices lower, cattle, both feeder and fat cattle, will stay strong. All right. All right, and that's you're looking forward, looking for it to just stay strong in the near term and medium longer term as we get yeah, out towards next year. You know, let's see what happens with the presidential elections. I think that's going to be obviously key. Um, if Romney gets elected, I think we can look forward to a uh, strong dollar, better business environment, possibly better economy, which will be good for the cattle market. 
if the president gets reelected, I have my concerns about what's going to happen with ethanol after the election and maybe after December 1st. Now, that's just my own personal uh, opinion on this. Certainly the president hasn't said anything about that. But I find it hard to believe that we're going to keep food prices high and the cost of all the food stamps and the government programs related to food. If the president can do something about it, and the easy thing to do is ethanol. All you have to do is cut ethanol by 500 million bushels, add that to the carryouts, and now you've got accepted carryouts and corn back at 4 or $5 a bushel. All right. So those are the two things that I see politically. The election is going to make a difference for the American farmer. All right. Let's talk hogs a little bit. Uh, you mentioned we're not seeing much of a liquidation there yet. Do you see that happening soon? What should pork producers be aware of? You know, you've got to watch these meal prices. Meal prices have come down. Technically, again, there's another chart that couldn't look worse. Uh, that gives me hope that, you know, maybe guys are holding off on this liquidation as these meal prices have come down, as the corn prices have come down. So I believe that, the, you know, we've got some positives in this hog market. Um, the spreads kind of bother me. We've got some of the nearbys at pretty good discounts in here. I'm not sure... You know, that would be normally indicative of liquidation, but we haven't seen it. So maybe some of the, you know, October, December hogs are maybe a little cheap relative to the back months. But overall, I think the hog producer has to watch these meal prices. If we can continue to keep meal under $500 a ton, I think we've got a, a chance of pushing it even lower. That'll be healthy for the hog market. And I think it'll encourage guys, whether it's poultry, whether it's hogs, that, you know, there's still some money to be made in, in certainly in the livestock or the poultry arena. Sure. And now, with, with that in mind, how much of the economy is, is going to drive hog prices real quick? What are your thoughts? I don't, think, I don't think the economy is going to be that big of a player, much more so in the cattle market than in the hog market. You know, overseas, we've got to see some more export demand. But domestically, I don't think the hogs will be nearly as tied to the economy as the cattle will be. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But if you'd like more information from Mark on where these volatile markets just may be headed, visit the Market Plus page at our website. You'll find expanded market analysis, audio podcasts, and streaming video of our program, as well as links to our Twitter feed and Facebook account, all free at the Market to Market website. Be sure to join us next week when we'll examine the market impact of the latest report on consumer spending. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by DuPont Pioneer, working with growers to match the right product to the right acre. Science with service, delivering success.